It's so good to hear the laughter and the blessings that are just being released into the atmosphere. Uh, the thing that I'm thankful for as I come in this morning is, is my family, and I get to be a mom. And we had a great Mother's Day. It made me reflect on uh, some of the nicknames that my, my children have given me throughout the years. And, and one of the nicknames that they've given me is Captain Obvious. Has anybody seen that Tim Hawkins video where, where Captain Obvious? Yeah, it's, it's a good one. And my kids think that Tim Hawkins probably followed us around for a little bit to get the material for that video. If you haven't seen it, uh, it's one where um, my kids would, would come to me, you know, maybe with a scraped bloody knee or a bump, a bump on the head from running to the table or something like that, you know, and I'd just look and I'd be like, oh, you really need to be more careful, you know. And they'd look at me with those eyes like, hmm, thanks, Captain Obvious. <laughs> or um, sometimes when we, when we lose something that happens often at our house, uh, when we lose something, and I'll be like, well, it's got to be here somewhere, right? Where's the last place that you put it? Well, Mom, I wouldn't be asking you if I knew the answer to that, right? Thanks again, Captain Obvious. So, uh, yeah, I got a good laugh out of that last week. And then I thought, as I was preparing for this message, some of the things that uh, we're going to talk about today, some of the strength lessons we're going to learn about today, they're so obvious. They're kind of in that simple vein. I thought, oh, I hope as we present that you don't look at me the same way that my kids sometimes do with kind of, hmm, thanks, Captain Obvious. Thanks for that pearl of wisdom. But I think as we lean into the text, what we're going to find is these obvious things, these simple things, as we believe them and obey them, God will come and transform our hearts and we'll be able to release his kingdom in ways and in refreshing ways that perhaps we haven't been able to experience before. So I am honored to be here. I'm glad to uh, be on this obvious journey with you this morning. Will you start with me with a word of prayer? Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you, uh, yeah, for each person in this room. As we were worshiping, I just saw open heavens over each life. Thank you for the blessings that you have poured out into our individual lives and us corporately. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and to, uh, yeah, just speak to each one of our hearts. May our hearts be softened to your word and to the ways in which um, we can be moved by the love, your great love that you have for us. And so, friends, if there, is, um, if there are any anxieties or burdens that you brought in to the room with you this morning, could you just in your, in your uh, heart's eye just lay those to the side? We will pick them back up, but for this next 40 minutes or so, we just want to focus on the Almighty God. Father, we realize we need you for that. So through the power of your Holy Spirit, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand the ways that you are moving in heaven so that we can usher that in into the kingdom here on earth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. So we're going to begin the morning message today where we left off last week um, with Roger. And how many of you were able to be here last week? Just a show of hands. Okay, so a lot of you have um, context for that. Roger talked about how King Asa, he started really, really well. But then along the way, we have evidence in the text that he let these little cracks in his heart and left unchecked, those cracks can become caverns and they can become caverns in our life. And the verse that we had to memorize, 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, um, the eyes of the Lord, Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. All right, how many of you have been able to memorize these verses as we've been going through? Turn to somebody next to you and see if you can uh, st restate that verse, scripture, scripture memory, and we'll get it up on the screen to help you. Okay, can you, 
How many have you have it hidden in your heart? All right, some of you I could hear. That's good. That's good. Well, as the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, I believe he found such a heart, a heart that was fully committed to him, a heart without much, many cracks in it, so to speak, in Nehemiah. As we've talked about this, this is our third week in the series, our power verses are best appreciated when we understand um, to knowing when, why, and how, we're, how they are giving. The Bible is just rich in history and riveting plots. And so we're going to take a look at that today to set up our strength verse for today. But Nehemiah, an effective leader, whose major role, he's, he's known for the rebuilding of the wall. So the wall of Jerusalem was in ruins um, several hundred years before the birth of Christ. And as we look throughout Nehemiah, it can, be, it can arguably be called the best leadership book uh, perhaps ever, ever written. And what is the secret sauce behind Nehemiah's great leadership? What is that one thing? I was praying about that all week. And I believe it's this. Nehemiah knew exactly where he sat in the intersection between heaven and and earth. I was introduced to this concept uh, by Leif, Leif Hetland um, a couple of months ago. And in the interest of um, full disclosure, at that time that I was introduced to this uh, material, I was not sitting in a good place. In fact, I had three distinct, distinct walls in my life that had just been shattered. And they were laying on the ground. I felt like in ruins. Some of us who have been in the church, maybe this would be a, a valley season. Some of us in counseling might uh, refer to this more as um, a midlife crisis. But when I got this book, um, The Strength You Need, in my box, I didn't even want to pick it up. And then I realized that the strength I needed was a shift, a shift in my mind and how I was looking at things. That's when Leif's, the three chairs, this teaching, he has chair number one, chair number two, chair number three. And he calls chair number one the sonship and daughtership chair. This is the chair where people who fit, in, who sit in this chair, they fully see the realities of the kingdom. They know of God's wisdom and his power and his joy. And they see those things and they bring those things everywhere they step. They usher in the kingdom of God. These are the people that have zest and zeal, a countenance on their face, light in their eyes. They know who, you, who they are and whose they are as sons and daughters of the Most High God. Now, chair number two, Leif calls the orphan chair or the orphan spirit. He says that uh, chair number one, definitely saved. He also says, chair number two, these people are saved. It's not an issue of salvation. It's one of sanctification, how we walk out our daily, our daily life. And so in the orphan spirit chair, the focus is a little bit more on soulishness. In the orphan spirit chair, the focus is on the problems and being overwhelmed by the problems instead of being overwhelmed by the greatness and goodness of God. In the orphan chair, I've heard this described as kind of victim mentality. This is a place where we give permission for um, self-pity, selfishness, apathy to operate. Where when we are full of the Spirit, there's no place, no place for that to be in our lives. And chair number three is the chair for um, those who are lost. 
those who don't know Christ. And just as a reminder, we all know this, we are invited to sit in this chair here always for the purpose of this chair as we bring the kingdom, right? Well, Nehemiah sat in chair number one. And we know that. How do we, how do we know that? How do we know that? No, just kidding. <laughs> he relied on God's covenant and faithfulness. When the walls were all torn down, he looked to God and God's strength. He knew where it came from. He knew where his earthly strength was going to come from. And that's the joy of the Lord. Our first clue to this is in chapter 1 of, of Nehemiah. He learns of this injustice that's happening to the remnant that's back in Jerusalem. Now, the book of Nehemiah is kind of a memoir, so to speak. And the opening lines of, of this memoir, and Nehemiah could easily be um, the Old Testament man of the year, right? He is an incredible leader. But we find him in the opening lines Sitting down to weep. Nehemiah learns that they were hanging by a thread back in Jerusalem. The ancient walls of the city were in ruins. His people, God's people, had no way of protecting themselves. Those who were around the city did not want them there. There was no funding for the rebuilding of a wall, and without the rebuilding of the wall, there would be no Jewish capital. Now, when his heart broke for the injustice that was happening, he sat down, and the, the Bible says that he wept, he fasted, he mourned, and he prayed. He doesn't sit down, though, in his weeping and his fasting and his mourning and his praying in chair number two. There's an injustice out there, and he doesn't. His first reaction is not to blame. His first reaction is not to shame. His first reaction is not to go to self-pity. His first reaction is to fully acknowledge his feelings and then look up at the greatness and the strength of God. In fact, it says in verse, in verse 5, Nehemiah begins, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who loved him and keep his commandments. And there's maybe our first obvious strength lesson. As we are uh, confronted with all kinds of injustices, you name your injustice, whatever it is, what chair do you go to? The blame, the self-pity, the shaming, or, and here's our first obvious strength lesson, you get that? Do we go to how great our God is? God's strength is great. There is an injustice happening here. I can recognize it. I don't sweep it under the rug, but God's strength is great. That's exactly where Nehemiah sits. After he prays through that, he goes through a time of confession. And we hear at the end of chapter, at the end of chapter one, he was cupbearer to the king. That is a prominent position, especially for um, a Jewish man in this foreign uh, place. Notice that doesn't come up until the end. Until he has acknowledged the greatness of God then, oh, by the way, I do have this prominent position. He has a right understanding. He understands that God is ultimately in charge. And it's God's strength and greatness. It has nothing to do with his position or his power. So his heart is broken for God's people. He mourns, he prays. And then he takes actions in step with God. He rightly acknowledges his feelings, takes responsibility, and moves forward. 
He pleads to the king and is released with great favor. He goes to build, rebuild the wall. He has uh, incredible vision and strategy. He's an incredible recruiter. He has everything in place. Over the course of a short amount of time, the wall is starting to be rebuilt. In fact, it's one of the best organized building programs probably in all of history. And things are going great. Have you been here? God's called you to do something. You have some momentum. You've started with God, but using a lot of your own strength. And then what happens? Whenever we are moving the kingdom forward, inevitably, conflict arises, right? Whenever we're facing injustice, moving things forward, there will be conflict. Nehemiah experienced the same thing. He experiences both internal and external. The local officials, uh, remember I said that um, the people around them didn't want them there. They started to threaten them. There was danger of attacks coming. And as that happened, the people that were rebuilding the wall started to get more anxious and more anxious. And there was a wave of discouragement that swept over the people. And this gives us insight into that next kind of obvious strength lesson. And that is that our strength is small. But Nehemiah teaches us to plead for God's strength through prayer. In Nehemiah 4.10, there's all these murmurings of, we're not going to make it. Why did we even start this? What were we thinking? The strength of the labor is giving out. Halfway through the project, they just want to give up. Does that sound familiar in our lives? As we watch what's happening in the world, halfway through, it is so easy to want to give up. Maybe the task is harder than what you thought, or the resistance is even greater. There's too much to do. And if it's something, time out, if it's something that God has not ordained for us to do, then yeah, we can step out. There's permission for that. But if this is something that he calls us to do, and we've started it in our own strength, we can recognize our human limitations and then plead for his divine impartation of his strength. Maybe in your life, I know in my life, I need to call for his strength, sometimes in some very significant relationships where I can't do it in my own power. I need his eyes to see that person in front of me the way that God does. Maybe it's... Um, God is calling you to, to be healthier, as simple as, as giving up on a diet or an exercise program. Maybe it's a project at work. Perhaps a stubborn temptation. Sometimes just finishing well. Sometimes we just can't muster up that inner strength. And that's when uh, Nehemiah refuses to sit in this chair. As all this external and internal stuff is happening within the city, he kind of shrugs his shoulders. I've got adversaries coming to me. Why would I listen to that? My God called me to this. He recognized he was a fantastic leader. He recognized he listened to all those problems and he went after him. He was not sitting on his heels. I'm not saying that. But he did not let those other voices deter him from the mission that God had called him to. In fact, I love six, chapter 6, verse 9. He wouldn't be drawn into that line of fire. Now strengthen my hands. Nehemiah has come to the end of himself. He fully recognizes that. Our strength is sometimes small. But he just prays this four-word sentence, now strengthen my hands. 
That's a great one. I've used it several times as a breath prayer this week, and it's amazing the shift that can happen in the atmosphere. So I hope that you're going to leave with two strength verses today. Can you turn to the person next to you and just say, I want to memorize, now strengthen my hands. Go ahead. Now strengthen my hands. And that is so powerful because it's in that time when we're at the end of ourselves that the enemy just loves to come in and discourage. The enemy just loves to sit and have you listen to things that are not true, that are not heaven's realities. And so we can use that simple prayer. Now strengthen my hands to go from this chair over into this chair. And that's exactly what happens the wall is uh, finished in record time. There is great celebration. Masses of people are coming back to Jerusalem, to settle in Jerusalem. And then in chapter 8, that's where we land for today, we get our, another leadership lesson. And this is also our strength verse for the week. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And Ezra, uh, just a little setup, Ezra is reading in this, um, in this chapter from the law. And the people start, the people that have come back begin to just gather around him. And some of the stuff that he reads and will read is just so obvious. But it's like this veil gets lifted from their, from their eyes. And they're able to see again in refreshing ways. So, uh, if you would like, you may turn with me. Nehemiah chapter 8. We're actually going to skip ahead or skip ahead just a little bit. The page number's on the screen there. When the seven month, seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who would understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. There's a list of people who stood right beside him. Skipping down to verse 5, Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted their hands and they responded, Amen! Amen! And then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They were so ashamed. The obvious was getting pointed out, and they had missed it generation to generation. The Levites and lists of Levites instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law, making it clear and giving meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and the scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send, send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of of the Lord is your strength. As the people had listened to Ezra, the commands and the promises of God, just like I said, there was a way, they began weeping. There was just a wave of grief that had swept over them. I wonder if part of the veil that had been lifting for them, that had lifted for them in those moments, was that they realized they had been living in darkness for so long that they decided to organize their lives around the darkness instead of organizing their lives around the light. 
And those were the simple commands that they were reading from. The Israelites, part of it, they hadn't been observing the feasts. They hadn't been acknowledging the Sabbath or taking a Sabbath. They had not been teaching God's love, his goodness to the generations, to their children. And they were sad when they realized this. But I love how it didn't take Nehemiah long to turn those emotional gears. Sometimes I can be sad and overwhelmed. And I can just sit in this spot right here. And Nehemiah said, no, not this day. This day is holy to the Lord. I came so you could have rest. Lay down your anxieties. Lay down your burdens. Shift, shift over into this chair. Our emotions are indicators, not dictators. Right, Matthew? That's something, yep, yep. They can tell us, you know, that something is off and that we need to shift. But we do not need to let them have free reign. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Simply stated, he helped them to reorganize their lives around the light instead of the darkness. Joy in that, the joy of the Lord, that joy in original context literally means to be joined. Allow your heart to be joined with the things of heaven. Allow it to be one in Christ. The joy to rejoin in Christ. To agree with heaven's realities is your strength. And strength is translated into a fortress, into a fortified place. When we allow our hearts, when we come into agreement with heaven's realities, we can become that fortified place. The joy of the Lord is our strength. As God's sons and daughters, we are called, we're invited to organize our lives around the goodness of God with glad hearts. We are co-laborers with him in this world. I mentioned uh, at the beginning, I mentioned that I had three walls that uh, had kind of come down. Actually, it was at the beginning of this, at the beginning of this series. And there was a, a wall of injustice that I am... Uh, just is near and dear to my heart. And it's a lot easier to stand up here and talk about it than it is to live in it. So I'm not trying to, um, I'm not trying to water that down. Because this injustice is very, it's heavy. It's hard. And it's so messy. But as I have been in the word, I've realized that, and actually it was Bob Dross who uh, showed this to me. He said, there is such a small crack between chair one and chair two, right? There's a shift. If I sit in this chair too long and become overwhelmed with all of the problems, with all of my pain, then that's what I focus on. And that small crack, right, in my heart, God invites me to shift over here and be overwhelmed with his goodness, with his love, with the realities of heaven that he is inviting me and each of you to usher into here on earth. And there's just something that happens supernaturally when we sit in this chair and think about his goodness and his greatness and our be God becomes so big, our problems don't go away, but 
they become small in comparison to who our God is. Whereas if I sit here too long, my problems become big and my God becomes small. So what are those action steps? What are those ways that we can continually keep the goodness of our God, that open heaven that is above us? Well, these action steps, again, might seem very obvious. So if you look at me with those Captain Obvious eyes, that's okay. Going back again to the scripture memory of those strength verses. The joy of the Lord to rejoin again with Christ. That is my strength. That is when I become a fortress. That is when you become a fortress and an agent to usher in the kingdom of God here on the earth. And if I could get that slide, we're on number two here. The front part of this verse talks, this is God's day. This is a holy day. God gives each one of us this gift of Sabbath. He desires for each one of us to partake in this gift of Sabbath. This is where we set ourselves apart from the world. One day where we can set down our cares, our anxieties, just to focus on his goodness and his strength. Every one of us, without exception, even Jesus needed this. We need to find that place of setting aside so that we can be refreshed in his rest. Jesus says in the New Testament that he came to give us rest. And yet sometimes we Christians can be some of the most worn out people on this planet, can't we? Hebrews 4 emphasizes that there is a rest that remains for God's people. But be careful, it is possible to miss it. God's rest is available to us, but it's not guaranteed. There is something we must do to enter into this rest. Mike Redmond talked about this a little bit um, on staff, and there's just a beautiful paragraph in Secrets of the Secret Place by Bob Sorge. I'm just going to read this to us. This is on Sabbath. God instituted the Sabbath, one day of rest out of seven, for several reasons. But one of the most compelling reasons is found in Exodus 31, 13. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that it is I, the Lord, who sanctifies you. In other words, God was saying, when you set aside a day each week for worship and rest, you are a fragrance to me, separate from all the peoples of the earth. All the other peoples work hard seven days a week, trying to get ahead. Life goes faster and faster to establish their lot in life. But you, you are my children. You are different. When you enter into a Sabbath, you have faith to believe that I can bless you more in six days of labor than the heathen can glean in seven days of labor. Your honoring of the Sabbath is proof to me that you believe in my provision, and it is a stunning garment that sets you apart from the strivings of all the other peoples of the earth. Your rest in my loving kindness makes you beautiful in my sight. What could be more energizing than that? Taking one day out of seven to just stop and gaze upon the glory of his enthroned majesty. In line with that, invite everyone during uh, this, this day, this holy day, to the 610 service tonight here in the auditorium for the purpose of his kingdom, Matthew 610. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a fantastic time of prayer and worship, a time just to gaze 
upon the beauty and the love of our Heavenly Father. And then the last action step I want to invite you into. Sometimes it's easy for me to get tripped up and organize my light, life around the darkness. And so I have in place a rule of life. And don't think of rules as like something you have to do. It's something that God invites us into. And basically, a rule of life is organizing your life around the goodness of God with glad and sincere hearts. And Steph Heatbrink on uh, September, on June, sorry, June 13, Tuesday, June 13, she is going to be teaching us uh, in the summer series uh, just how to develop a rule of life. So would love for you to participate in that. As I've talked today, I can see some of us in this room are already sitting here in chair number one. We know our identity in Christ. We claim the inheritance of his sons and daughters. That is a beautiful thing. Praise God. But all of us, no matter where we're sitting, are invited in this moment, right here, into this chair. That you could put aside the worries of the world and just gaze on the beauty and the goodness of your creator. You are his son. You are his daughter. There is an open heaven and a mission for your life. And he wants you to know it. You usher in his kingdom wherever you go.